All right, John. So I was helping a gal in our community, and she was standing in her basement, and she had inherited all of her mom's stuff when her mom passed away, the whole estate. And so it was commingled then with all of her stuff that she had acquired over the years. And so there was boxes and Rubbermaid totes, and some were labeled and some weren't. And she was just standing there in front of all this stuff. And I said, what are you feeling right now? And she said, I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest and I can't breathe. Yeah. And that's maybe one of the little more extreme cases of how we feel when we go to declutter. But I think so often we hear the comments of, I, I feel anxious, I, I don't wanna make a mistake, right? I don't wanna get rid of something and then realize, oh, I could have used that. And so, so many, feel this anxiety creep in when we're trying to declutter our house. We know we should declutter our house. There's a lot at stake with it, but when we actually sit down to do it, we're like paralyzed by this fear of making a wrong decision. Welcome to the Minimal Mom Podcast. Dawn reaches a million women each month with practical tips to simplify your home. Although I've always been very organized and neat, being a single mom with health issues was a whole new challenge. And then a few years ago, I saw a video with Dawn asking us if we really wanted to keep managing all of our stuff. My jaw dropped and the world froze around me for a moment while my entire perspective changed. Being a low income single mom, I was afraid of not having enough. But suddenly all I wanted to do was be intentional about how much I took on to manage. Not only was my household more manageable now, but so was my schedule and the invisible load that I chose to carry. Dawn literally changed my entire life in one moment with one question. Today, Dawn is joined by Dr. John Deloney, an anxiety and mental health expert, author of the book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, and host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. So today, if you could just tell us the answer to that, I think <laughs> I, I think Simple. that would be awesome. Yeah. So I, I think in... I, I love your the story that you just told because that's an extreme example that applies to all of us. Mm -hmm. I think it's really common, especially when somebody has inherited things, mm -hmm. that the memories of the person become transferred to the stuff. Yeah. And whether and, and, and that's that's the same as like with my little kid, right? Mm -hmm. These ridiculous art drawings that look like somebody died yeah. via crayon. Yeah. And I want to hang on to it, right, forever and ever because my, my daughter, my son's trapped in this. They're not, right? It's just mm -hmm. junk. It's, it really yeah. is just junk. Right. And we're not ever going to sell this for a million dollars, right? They're not going to be Picasso. So, right. But I think going back saying what she's really feeling on her chest is – my mom is now here mm. and, and I can't breathe with mom here. Yeah. And so it's pull, it's, it's pulling mom out of this thing. Okay. So in everything about anxiety, I always wanted to, to roll down to three pillars, um, connection, human interaction, mm -hmm. um, safety mm -hmm. and autonomy. Do I have control over what comes next in my day? Right. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> when, when I look at this tent that I haven't used in 11 years and it's like, what are we doing here? All right. The safety alarm goes off. Okay. If you get rid of this and the house burns down, yeah. we're, we're hosed. Right. 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 And so I need to then check, do I have the other two pillars lined up? Okay. Do I have people in my life that I could call if mm. my house burns down? Yeah. And so often in our current culture, we don't. Right. We don't have anybody to call. Right. Or um, do I owe money on my mortgage mm. so that if I don't make a payment, they're going to take it away, I'm going to live in this tent? Because is this tent really a backup plan? Because my body knows I'm not safe because yeah. we owe somebody else money. And I don't have autonomy. I don't decide what I do tomorrow. Bank of America does yeah. or the, the mortgage company does. Yeah. If I have transportation to work and I owe a payment on that thing, if I stop making the payment, the bank comes and takes it back. Yeah. My frontal lobe knows I got a good deal on that car. The anxiety part of my brain that keeps me alive knows we're not safe because yeah. one missed payment and they're coming back to get this car and we don't go to work and then it all comes, to, right? Right. So I always want to look at those three pillars. When one of those things wow, goes off. Wow, from a tent. Does that make sense? From yeah, a tent, from right? a tent. It sets off these hard It wasn't alarms. my mom's tent. It no, was a tent. it was just a tent, <laughs> like, right? And, and then when we're untangling, the key to untangling stuff from people is grief, mm. is owning mom's gone yeah and she's not captured in a couch or in a picture frame or in a whatever mom's not there yeah. right yeah so then take us practically through this I'm in the garage I know I need to declutter so what's at stake here like you're an anxiety expert like can I just keep the tent in the garage can I just keep the extra stuff 
do I really need to get my environment simplified? What's actually at stake here? Yeah. So one of the, some of the beautiful research that was really compelling to me, we were talking before we started, it's been, it's been sad for me because it's true, is that like the rise in ADHD, the rise in anxiety, the rise in some of these things can be directly linked to chaotic environments. Mm. and our body's trying to adapt to chaos. And I know it's really hip and cool to be like, it's all genetic or it's all biological. All that stuff is triggered environmentally. And so when I live in a world of chaos Mm -hmm. or in my house, when I just got stuff everywhere and I'm a, I am a, like a poser prepper, like it could all go down. My dad was a homicide detective. Like I know it could all end, right? I have to know that choosing to live in that chaos, mm-hmm. the, the other side of that teeter-totter, yeah. yes, I've got enough rations to last us for a year. Right. The other side of that teeter-totter is my brain constantly is screaming at me, we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe, it's too, much, we're, it's too chaotic, yeah. right? Right. And so I want to always say, do I use this stuff? Mm-hmm. Is this stuff serving a purpose? Mm-hmm. And the rest of it's got to go. Yeah. Right. So really we're having to promote our peace of mind our ability to have a safe place to come home to, right? Because we're actually, I mean, are you saying we're actually not feeling safe in our house when it's like completely cluttered? Uh, uh, yeah, our calendars are cluttered. Our relationships are cluttered. Our homes are cluttered with mm. just stuff. And think about it. In the, the, the course of human history, homes have never been so full of st- Our right. living environments haven't been so overwhelming. Right. And so our brains are just trying to adapt to a new world, which is stuff everywhere and on every wall and on right. the ceilings and right. special... It's too much, right? Yeah. And you, you, you put that on top of calendars that there is – you cannot miss a red light or your mm-hmm. whole domino of your day is over, right? Because mm-hmm. you're late to this and you're late to that. Um, and our pantries and our food – it's just too much. It's too much. And our brains are saying we're not okay. Yeah. It's too much, right? But we might head into a recession. We might. I mean – Absolutely. Is it still – I mean, if the economic climate's changing, I mean, sh- isn't it giving me some safety if I have all this stuff saved up? There, if, 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 if you're, I don't actually think you know, it does, so you know, <laughs> yeah. so, man, um, uh, but I know those thoughts come I know, in, I'm right? Gonna, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get you canceled is what I'm trying. Ah, I'm yeah. trying to, I'm going to answer this honestly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'll preface this with, I am a six foot two. I don't know. If, oh, this is on YouTube, right? Yeah. I'm a big guy who's a lifelong Texan, whose dad's a cop. I've run around with police officers, right? I am I train mixed martial arts. I'm ready to go if we need to, right? So I'm prefacing all that to say this. I've been in buildings and in rooms and in homes when the worst of the worst happens. Yeah. And what I will tell you is having yet another weapon or mm-hmm. yet another seven months of food. Yeah. There has been tiny snapshots in history when, fair enough, that yeah. would have been helpful. Mm-hmm. 99% of the time, the greatest thing you can do during the middle of a calamity or crisis is know your neighbors. Yeah. Know the people in your community. Yeah. Have a guy you can call that can help you. With, like, he's got the tools to fix the whatever. Right. He'll come over. Yeah. Because we have a relationship. Because we've had yeah. meals before. Right? right. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. And so the greatest thing you can do in, if to prepare for a recession mm-hmm. is get to know your neighbors. Yeah. Get to have people over for dinner and say, you bring something and you bring something and you bring something. Now it costs all of us six bucks for us to all share. Is that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Cancel your subscription service and have people in your front yard yeah. uh, around a fire pit. Right? Right. And this isn't woo-woo and this is this is just neuroscience no. and economics, right? Yeah. Well, and I think we can then bring that back to my friend in her basement and say she was trying to do it alone. And it what really stood out – we're going to talk about your book too. What really stood out to me as I was listening to it is that grief is meant to be done also in community. That it we, can only be done in community. And so here she is trying to not only declutter but grieve, trying to rationalize like what is wrong with me, right? Mm-hmm. All by herself. Yeah. Like that we need to do it with each other. The great David Kessler says grief demands a witness. Yeah. I've got to sit down and say I'm hurting and my mom's not here. I gotta say those words and I gotta say them in front of somebody else. Yeah. Um so if I'm her, I'm starting with writing a letter saying, Dear mom, hmm. I miss you. Yeah. And you left me a whole bunch of junk, Ma. And we've been talking about right. So I'm gonna have that I'm gonna have that quote unquote conversation. And then we're gonna sit down with a couple of friends and they're gonna help me go through this stuff. Yeah. And we're gonna find people that um the back end of grief is making meaning, right? What's what what's the what's the purpose now? Yeah. Who really needs a couch in my community? Who really needs another dresser, right? And right. there are people in your community that have needs. Yeah. Let's go put this stuff. Let's go let mom like mom's goodwill and let's spread that around yeah. to people who need it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So John, I mean, let's talk about your book a little bit. It, if you could say one thing 
about anxiety today, one clear takeaway, what would it be that you would want everyone to know? In almost every case, anxiety is not the problem. Anxiety is just simply an alarm system letting you know it's your body trying to get your attention that things in your life and your environment are not okay. Yeah. Back on those three pillars. I'm mm-hmm. disconnected. You found yourself alone. Yeah. And it's important for me because I'm surrounded by people all the time. I can often find myself alone in a crowded room. Yeah. There's been years. I, I'll celebrate 20 years of marriage this summer. There's been years I shared a bed with a woman who I know loves me. Yeah. And I feel completely lonely. Right. And yeah. so lonely can be proximal or it can be emotional. Right. Mm-hmm. Or I'm not safe. I'm in an abusive relationship. I'm in an abusive work situation. I owe somebody money and it can all go away, right? I'm yeah. not safe. Yeah. And then the third one is I'm not in control of my tomorrow. Yeah. Right? And it's just an alarm that just lets us know. Yeah. And I think if, I mean, that was a huge mental shift for me. It's like, it's an alarm. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. But like you said, you can't tape over the gas gauge or the smoke right, alarm, right? right, right. right, right? That's, that's the, the best analogy is when the smoke alarm goes off in our kitchen, if we race to get up and we take the batteries out, we have not fixed the fire right. that's burning our kit, our living our, room. Like down. when we're making a pizza and the, like the pepperoni falls on the burner, and then uh-huh. the kids just go, they know which doors to close yes, on yeah, the main right. level so that the smoke alarms don't go off. Yes, exactly. So it's that's the, the alarm's not the problem. It's just letting yeah. us know, hey, something in your house is on fire. Yeah, it's trying to it's actually trying to help, right? Yeah, and I would highly recommend your book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Um, if if at all possible, listen to it on Audible. Because I think what came across the most as I was listening to it was your passion and your belief that any of us could deal with this Mm -hmm. and get through it and that we don't have to keep living like this. So do you honestly believe any of us watching right now or feeling anxious that like we could get through this? Yeah, I, 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 I'm a lifelong, I've been working in crisis for my whole career and, um, been working in, in people's mental health for years. Yeah. And I think we've overcomplicated it and I think we've mm-hmm. overprofessionalized it and we've over dramatized it. And, um, I don't say that to disparage my community. I love the right. mental health community. They are doing great work. Yeah. Um, we've just made it a mental health, something that you go do yeah. and you have to do it over there. Yeah. And I think for most of us, not all of us, mm-hmm. but most of us, um, can do a lot of the healing in our homes in and with our communities yeah and i think that a hundred percent of us whether you what i don't care what trauma you've had there is healing on the other side of this if we will grieve what has happened and take ownership of it mm-hmm. and then ask that one terrifying scary question what are we going to do now yeah. right and that's where most yeah. of us get stuck yeah so i found it i mean so practical i mean it really felt like you were inside my head a lot of the like things you were talking out like mm-hmm. and then i was thinking this and then and so it felt so practical um so many good stories and yeah. it i mean i was captivated the whole way through the book and so if someone's watching today they're like okay yeah i've probably been taping over the gas gauge like i'm not looking <laughs> at it like what would be that one step today to like go to the gas station stop mm-hmm. ignoring it what's what, what's one thing i could i could take away today and do um i Man, that's a great question. I think th- the most practical thing is to take a quick inventory, and I hate that word when it comes to people, but it is what it is. Take a quick inventory of who would I call in the middle of the night if mm-hmm. I needed someone to come watch my kids because um, I had to take my spouse to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Who would come over if my mom – who would I call if my mom died? Yeah. And quickly take an inventory of the people in your life. Yeah. And if you are found yourself alone – if you found yourself without a community or you still are telling those stories from 14 years ago with your friends from college, yeah. like that's just like, remember that time? The reason guys get together when they're 40 and still tell old high school football stories is because that's the last time most of us were part of something bigger than ourselves. Wow. Yeah. The reason women get together and tell that sorority story yeah. over and over again yeah. is because that's the last time they were truly connected. Mm-hmm. And our task, we don't have a picture of how to make friends and how to be in community. Our task as 35 year olds and 40 year olds and 50 year olds is to say those were awesome and I love those people. Yeah, I gotta have that. I gotta recreate that in my home. I gotta recreate right. that in my neighborhood, in my church, and wherever I happen to be. And that's gonna let my body go. Yeah. And now I can deal with the childhood trauma. Now I can right. deal with the racist idiots. Now I can deal with this stuff because yeah. I'm anchored into other people. Yeah, that's where I'd start. And I loved in your book because I think many could look at you and be like, well, John, you're charismatic. You're friendly. Dude, I am a train wreck. <laughs> and you said we actually had to like sit down and be like. Will you guys be our friends? Yes, like- <laughs> yes, yeah. And here's what's here's what's really bizarre about that. 
that that story took place about two and a half years ago. So it wasn't even that long ago. No, and I don't hang out with those two people very much anymore. They're, I still oh, love them and we're yeah. close. But li- I moved, okay. and they ended up getting a different job and got here. So all of a sudden, life shifted again. So yeah. just recently, I've come off the road. I've, I've had a season where I'm on the road all the time. My wife said, you know what you got to do. And I was like, oh, no. And she goes, you got to find friends. And I was like, but I have friends. And she goes, really? Because I just got this book. And then I was like, oh, no. So <laughs> the thing is this. The process starts over again. Yeah. And the process starts over again. And that is a life well lived, is yeah. not trying to fix, find this one place. It's kind of like you, like you can sit with somebody, declutter their house. Mm-hmm. Then grandma's going to pass away and the U-Haul's yeah. going to show up. And so yeah. we're going to do it again. And then we're going to yes, do it again. Right. right? And right. that is life. And yeah. if you can make peace with that, then yeah. it's like, oh, okay, here we go again. Yeah. And it's not this dramatic. I thought we solved this. No, mm-hmm. you don't solve mental health. You continue to live it and live it and live it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Well, of course, we'll put links down below for your book. And I do think, I mean... I don't like the word like therapeutic, but I do think decluttering can be kind of a therapeutic process too, to realize like, yes. oh yeah, I was clinging to this. I was finding my safety in this, but. Can I tell you my chief, my chief complaint with um, the last hundred years of, of psychotherapy is this. Um, we've told people that mental health, the key to mental health is getting the right thoughts in the right order. Mm-hmm. And if you can just order your thoughts the right way, yeah. then everything is fixed. Mm-hmm. And there is some truth to we've got to get our control of our thoughts. There's a whole section of the book about controlling your thoughts. But we got to do stuff. Yeah. you got to move your body. You have to come up with a plan and say, I'm going to start this and finish this, and here's what the result is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so I think something as simple as and as challenging as decluttering, mm-hmm. I'm going to say I'm going to – choose to free my life up yeah. i'm gonna have to go through some memories i'm gonna have to have a hard conversation with my yeah. spouse and my kids yeah. i'm gonna go through this process and at the end it's gonna look like this and yeah. it's gonna be hard and challenging there is something about the doing of that mm-hmm. that will change your brain literally i can do hard stuff and i can have a hard conversation my husband and yeah. i've been having needing to have this conversation for yeah. 10 years and we have it. we're having it now i took control of my kids and said yeah. pick two the rest of it's yeah. leaving right and suddenly you find this I'm stronger than I thought I was. Yes. I can do things that it, and that bleeds over into, I'm not going to let that guy at work talk to me anymore. And by the way, I'm not driving this fast anymore. I'm going to get in the other lane and just set crew. It begins to bleed over into your other life, yeah. into the rest of your life, right? So I think yeah. you're exactly right. Just go declutter your house. And this is the pot talking to the kettle, man. We were just talking. <laughs> I was, we're headed there next. I was in my, yeah, in my morning gym this morning. I was like, i got to make some changes, right? Just today I was doing that. <laughs> and what keeps you? So personally, what yeah. keeps you from just going home and, and donating it all? Or what, what causes you to hang on to this stuff? Is it the prepper or the... It, it is. It's, yeah. um, I grew up in a house. My dad was a homicide detective. Yeah. And so 100% of his day um, inside the bell curve was dealing with stuff that never happens. Wow. Nobody gets chopped up with a hatchet. And nobody... My dad, that that's where he spent all Tuesday. Yeah. Right? And so that slowly bleeds to... At any moment, it could all come down, yeah. and you better be right. And yep. so I've got that wired into me. Yep. And so there is, like, yep. let's just be super real. I've got a, a – the garden at my house is insane. I live out in the woods. The garden is bananas. Garden is a spiritual thing for me and my wife. Yep. It's something I love with my kids close to the soil. And it's obnoxious, right? <laughs> and And here's the fourth thing. We don't buy vegetables for about five months out of the year. And so it has a, it does Mm -hmm. have a tangible budget thing. I drive to Missouri to buy my beef and I buy it like in bulk and blah, because I'm a weirdo. There is something nice about not having to have bought meat in the last three yes. months, right? It's knowing the areas, it's, right? Exactly. What does help actually give security yes. and what is like, dude, we grew up poor, right? It's, yes. I would yeah. never, my mom would never have gotten rid of the extra craft supplies and the extra yes. clothes and the extra linens. Yes, like, yes. that's just ridiculous, Do I right? need 42 fishing rods? <laughs> really? Or do I need two? Because how yeah. often do I go fit, right? Do I yeah. need 11 baseball gloves? Yeah. That's where I look around and think, oh, I need another one of those, another yeah. one of those, and suddenly... Um, I'm not being a good steward of my resources. Yeah. I'm creating a chaotic world for my kids to grow up in. Yeah. And I'm weighing myself down. Right. So it's time yeah. for me to get back into it. You know, we probably should just touch on kids real quick. Yeah, yeah. If you could do 30 seconds on what do your kids need and not need when it comes to stuff, what would you say? I'll just tell you the story. The other night, I've got two, again, the Texan living out in the woods is going to come out here. I got two turkey decoys out in my front yard that I just put up there. And my daughter, who's six, she's a human hurricane. Um, I want to like to buy her music and I want her to like, I'm going to like, I want to curate a great life for her. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had, she had a wooden sword and I had a stick and somehow she's a weird, she was a wolf creature and I was a dragon of some sort. 
and we were run out and we were defending the turkey decoy. I don't understand what was going on, but we f- <laughs> air sword fought and we were doing somersaults and whatever for about an hour. And we went back inside and I heard her telling my wife, my wife is reading her the, her bedtime story. She said, today was my favorite day of my whole life. And so I tell parents this, um, it's the greatest parenting advice I ever received is from Jack Black, which is don't try to make a happier, a happy kid happier. And so I'll see my kid with a stick in the mud and they're just screwing around with it. And I'll think, my kid doesn't play with sticks and mud. They need some. And they end up an hour later with this blinky toy in another yeah. game and they're over sugar. Mm-hmm. Let your kids play. What your kids really, really, really want is you. Yeah. They want you. They want you. And you is free, right? Yeah. So yeah. create space and time. Get rid of all the junk. Give your kids space to breathe and sleep and, whew, and give them you. That's awesome. Well, John, this was... I'm still kind of like, wait, where am I? What's going on? No, I'm this so was glad so you're, fun today. This is my Thank favorite you. thing. No one's awesome. ever uh, uh, interviewed me in this house. It's so yeah. great. This makes wow. my, we should do this more often. <laughs> awesome. So good. Thank you for hey, being with us today. Can I tell you this? Thank you yeah. for putting joy into the world and for giving people tools. Um, the most common thing I hear all over the country is, okay, now I know. I don't know what to do next. And you do that for people. So thank you so much for providing like joy in the world and with a smile. You're just so lovely. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're looking for more support, be sure to check out The Minimal Mom on YouTube too.